Hello, folks, and welcome to a streaming show from Club Passim. My name is Matt Smith, and I'll be your host this evening. Um, we're going to be taking you on a, a deep dive conversation about the Sub Rosa songwriting retreat. Now, this weekend, we were supposed to have the shows that were the songs from last year's retreat happening. Um, we have moved those shows to May. Um, so you can make sure to visit passim.org and you're going to see the new dates um, for the May shows. They're going to be on May 2nd and 3rd. And uh, we'll, we'll drop the, uh, here, I'll, I'll just take a hot moment here and drop into the chat the um, the link that you can go to, to, to for tickets. Uh, they're on sale to members now. They'll go on sale to the public this upcoming Wednesday. Um let me tell you a little bit about Club Passim before we get started. Passim is a nonprofit organization. We've been running as a nonprofit now for about 27 years. The venue's been around in Harvard Square for over 60 years. Uh, we are, as a nonprofit, not just a music venue. We put on outreach programs. We have a music school. We um, give grants to artists through our Iguana Music Fund. We have festivals like BCM Fest, our Celtic Festival. We have our Campfire Festival, our Down Home Up Here Bluegrass Festival. And we do all of this with the help of your support. If you go to passim.org slash stream, you will see a yellow donate button. You can make a donation to this show. And part of that donation for this show is going to be split with Passim and the Sub Rosa Songwriting Retreat. Uh, which happens yearly on a place called Three Mile Island up in Lake Winnipesaukee. We've got many of the folks that uh, have been part of that retreat uh, that are going to be here over the course of tonight. Just so you know, tonight's not going to be songs. You're not going to hear the songs, but we're going to take a deep dive kind of podcast style into what this retreat means and has meant uh, over the years and how it has changed and developed and grown and what, you know, what are the seeds of the ideas behind it. So we'll get into some conversations. If you want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat and we'll see if we can get to those questions. And um, we've got so many amazingly talented artists, a lot of your favorites that you've seen at Club Pass seen many, many times. Um, but I'm, what I'm going to do to start things off is bring on Rose Polanzani, who was one of the roses that was that were the, the impetus for the Sub Rosa shows. Now, I know that the first show happened at the Lizard Lounge and it was basically a date that that billy beard had booked for something and it fell apart that's Is that right, right? yeah that's right and he asked me if i could um he, i think he knew rose cousins was in town and he was mm -hmm. like can you get a few people together put a bill together something like that and i think it actually came out of a slight misunderstanding where i thought <laughs> i really thought most I good thought, things like, do come a lot of people like a lot of people and i didn't you know because i'm not a promoter but i don't book shows but anyway, I just <laughs> asked a bunch of people. And one of the people that came that day was somebody who had been like an opener for the original show who was still traveling through town. So she was somebody we didn't that we didn't know, but she just was a part of it. And everyone just hung out and like we didn't rehearse at all. We just played along completely blind, which was really and, and magical. And so was that person, was that the kind of the first idea of the stranger that would... Yeah. Uh, uh, so if, if folks hadn't been to the, the, the Sub Rosa shows that were happening at Lizard Lounge, generally it's this, you know, a dozen from anywhere from a dozen to 20 people that would be kind of a, mm -hmm. a, a core band and then people that would come in and out and do songs with uh, different groupings and sometimes all together. But at, at the midpoint a stranger would be introduced, someone mm -hmm. that, that you specifically did not know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Billy would always book that person. Yeah. It's so funny hearing you talk about this. I almost feel like I have like to promote a show that's happening next month. I get I'm like getting excited. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, wait, no, no, this hasn't happened for many years. <laughs> like, Oh, well, my goodness. It's just been such a loss. It's such a wonderful, wonderful but, experience. But also, you know, it, it is such an incredible snapshot of that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. In the, the Cambridge Somerville music scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when all, the, so can you remember who was at that first show? No, but, um, but I remember in the early days, I remember Dan Cardinal, who's at Dimension Sound. He, mm -hmm. he was, he was just running sound. And I remember um, Aoife O'Donovan was, was, I think there, the early shows we had, Billy, we had um, like Billy Beard on drums. Sorry. Yep. We had Denty, <laughs> we had Aoife O'Donovan. Um, 
Rose Cousins was there. Oh, gosh, Ann Heaton. Ann he- yeah, right. Because Ann Heaton was living in town then. Jennifer Kimball was usually at a, at a lot of those early ones. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Sean was, I'm trying to remember who the bass player was in the beginning. Now we have Zach holding down the bass. But oh, yeah, right. I, it was just such a rotating cast as well. Like, well, and Austin um, Nevins was usually the guitar player back mm-hmm. then in those early days. Dave Champagne. Dave Champagne, yep. Yep. Oh, I'm going to feel bad. I'm com- coming back. No, Let's it's it's this, so much. It's, I mean, the, yeah, yeah, but, but that's, I mean, like, that's, a, there's so many people have played in so it many. over over the years. And, yeah. and I'm sure there are loads of audience members out there who they remember these sub rosa shows as their first time seeing that performer mm-hmm. you know you know it's it was like because it was this big ever expanding family of people that well, would that would be around that's where i met dietrich i met him because he was a stranger yeah. and um that, that's crazy to even think about i know i know well and I, and I was just talking with abby earlier about how back then was sort of like dave kadowski was everywhere you know like like he he was he was starting to do more shows of his own and you know i'd go see him at toad and and zach and mark would be his band and then for a while when dave was living in town here it was like dave was my go-to for whenever a show fell through and i needed somebody to fill a slot it was dave godowski yeah and and you know and then i thought how like Dietrich became the new Dave Godowski in that sense, where he was like the guy who was always around. You could always pull him in to do a show and it, and it would be something creative and different and interesting. But, yeah. you know, there there are so many people that have been part of that world, um, you know, and, and so these shows were probably happening for a couple of years before the retreat started to happen. That's right. Yeah. And and they came out of. Dave Champagne had tried to do songwriting retreats for a long time up on Three Mile mm-hmm. and um. And this, but this was an opportunity where we had like a group of people that had been kind of coming together and putting our heads together and then coming out with creative material. It was just like, here we have a naturally occurring group and let's bring that group to another place. Um, Yeah, no, it was, it was, it, it, it wasn't is like a really special introduction and connection to like just being together and listening to each other. And it, and it drew on so many things that, I had learned from other musicians in Cambridge and I, I really feel like it could probably happen anywhere, but sometimes people, people would come. The most common thing people will say to me when, when they've seen the show is that they've never seen anything like it before yeah. and they, they can't imagine it happening anywhere else. But we know it can. Like Laura Forte, she started one in Belgium and, and uh, <laughs> Caitlin Canty wants to start one in Nashville. So Well, and, but it's, you know, it, it is one of those things and it is a real snapshot of that moment. And I remember, there were there were nights where, you know, I would find out that there was going to be a Sub Rosa show, but I was working over at Club Passim that night. And I'd be like, oh, damn it. You know, and then I would, I, the second the show was over and I'd lock the door, I would run to the Lizard Lounge and try to catch oh, the man. tail end of it. You know, like, they were always so fun. They were magical nights. But I want to bring Dinty Child in here to, start, to tell yeah. a little bit about this place <laughs> where it happens. Hey. So now anyone that knows Dinty Child knows something about three mile island (laughs) now so dinty i know that like your history with three mile goes really really far back um it goes does it go back to your grandparents my grandfather started working there in 1911. that's amazing that's amazing my parents my parents met there my dad was working there and my mom and, and and you have had your children that have met and gotten married. Yes. So that's that's uh, th- there's a, such a long long history. Now, um, what we I know we've got a map of the island here that I think we can bring up cool. just so people get a sense of it. So this is this is uh, you know when you get to the island, you're you're kind of down on the the southeastern tip of it where you come in. Yeah, forty three acres. So that. Like looking at this map, it's what I don't know, maybe like a half mile long and a quarter mile across, or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, my, my my gauge is like it. T- it takes probably like a good half hour to to walk around the perimeter of the island on on, on like the shore path. Twenty two minutes. 
20, 22 minutes, depending on how slippery the rocks are that right. day. You know, and to give people a sense, like the, the eastern coast is very rocky and there's it's kind of a cliff for a, for a, a long part of it. Um, and, you know, there's there's different, you'll, you'll notice if you can see on the map, the cabins are located all around the perimeter of the island. How many, how many cabins are there? Like 40? 50. 50 cabins around. And so they're all around the perimeter except for the cook's cabin, you, you know, like that. Yeah. That's... Yeah. There's the tower. There's a couple little things. And right. right. Staff, cab, staff cabins, all the guest yeah. cabins are on the water. Yeah. And so now you'd been going to the Island for your entire life. Yeah. You can start going when you're four. So that's, <laughs> so yeah. So I was going since I was four and eventually uh, there's a, summer crew of it's it's primarily a summer family camp um right it's appalachian mountain club yeah appalachian mountain club summer family camp they have other what they call full service camps there's cold river in the white mountains and uh echo uh lake in uh, on mount desert island <clears throat> and um so there's a crew of uh 18 college age kids late high school early college age kids um who work in the summer and do all the jobs. And so I did that with 71, 72, I think. And eventually I took over as the off season manager. And I took that job over from um, many people will know Celia Woodsman from Della May. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took that job over from her dad. So she, she grew up going to this Island. She basically started singing with us on, on that Island. So, um, uh, yeah, so a long history, so, but, the, but the upshot is that I'm the off season manager. So I have the keys when it's not the summer <laughs> and, and, there's, and there's a Very high important. security, there's a high security electric fence around the entire yeah. Island. <laughs> not, not, not so, <laughs> so you'd been part of these sub Rosa shows. You had the keys to this Island. Yeah. How, how did the, how, like, what sparked the idea? So the first year of the Iguana Grant, which anybody knowing, watching the show probably knows about, an incredible passing program to support artists. Um, Sean Staples actually got a grant for a microphone, I believe. He bought a nice microphone. <clears throat> and I think the first year of the Iguana Fund, it was sort of like, yeah, what's that? I don't know, I, you know, what, whatever. But then it's like he he actually got some money, and it was like, <laughs> okay, if 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 I was to get some money, two thousand dollars, I think was the maximum grant um, then and now. Uh, what would I do? And it's we had done at that point. We had I don't know how many of the Sub Rosa shows we had done. We you know probably four or five or something like that, and. Um, it was not something we ever have did a lot, but, um, you know, we would be getting together in the afternoon and cramming, learning a whole bunch of songs and hang out with these people. And we'd do the show and then it was done. We were gone until the next time, um, which is, it has its own little magic. But uh, I thought, wow, if what would be really cool is to get those people who I all, who I like so much and are all great musicians and get them up there for a number of days and um, see what we could do. And like Rose said, Dave Champagne had tried, I think a couple, two or three times he had tried to have songwriting retreats there, but they were more like um, people had to pay a bunch of money and stuff like that. And musicians don't have a lot of money. So I thought, well, <laughs> use if we could use the money to basically rent the island to go, um, and rather than, and just have it be a collaborative thing. I mean, to the point where we were, we'd take turns cooking meals and mm -hmm. stuff like that. We would just yeah. buy a bunch of groceries. Well, mostly didn't Dave Champagne mostly cooked? Well, that's <laughs> true. <year. laughs> well, he, yeah, he, he kind of was in charge of the food and he'd cook a couple of nights and then yeah. other people would make stuff other nights. But I mean, it's very, just a very uh, community collaborative thing. And, you know, we had, um, Ethan, Ethan didn't come, but I, was it the first year Anais came, Anais Mitchell came, or the second year? 
first year. I can't remember one of those years. And, um, uh, you know, so we, we just, and I think we determined that there were probably eight or nine of us that first year. Now we're up to a, a fairly consistent, um, Fifteen, eighteen, yeah. and in my in my conception, it was always going to be kind of a rotating thing because we had people like Rose Cousins and Zach out with Josh Ritter and people who toured a lot. Who I figured, well, they could come one year and then they couldn't come the next year. Well, guess what? Change <laughs> your schedule so that they could keep coming. Um, so it has stayed a very solid. Um, group of people. And, and I know there are people who, you know, would love, love to come to this. And in fact, there are many more people now who would qualify because our qualifying has always been that you had to have played the Sub Rosa show. Mm -hmm. But the fact is we just don't have the room to to do, do it. We've determined that it, it has to be less than 20 people. 12 is the ideal number. And it has to be less than 20 to, to make it work just the way we sit around in the main room and do stuff. And Well, let's, let's bring everybody else in and, and, and sort of kind of open up this conversation. So a, a lot of folks uh, <laughs> that were here. Well, so as we, as we bring, yeah, as they all get smaller and smaller, we'll, we'll go through, let's go through a few of these photos here just so, you, so people can get a sense of the Island. Now this is the main dock that you come in on uh, when, when you arrive at the Island and um yeah, this this is looking north from that dock. Ah, uh, I know this. You, you'll see some beauty, and this is later on mm. that day, apparently. Yeah. So here's kind of the shore paths. You can see how you know it's they're, they're they're tiny little paths that are. I mean, they're they're well kept, but they <laughs> are they are, you know, quite small. And definitely treacherous at times. <laughs> uh, what is it? Is this up at North Point? Yeah. Okay, so it's this is the northern part. Yeah, no, yeah, that's Dietrich's 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 yeah, the shooting range. That, that that right there is about the spot where Mark and I finished writing the song "Look Up." Yeah. I think to the right, and that and that's when you when you saw Charlie's capsized. Charlie boat. Rose was turned over out in the middle of the lake, standing on the bottom of the boat. He just Thank God we looked up. Yeah, that's, right. that's clearly Cortese's cabin. That's clearly <laughs> Cortese's cabin. <laughs> Uh, oh, hey, Timothy. Uh, Timothy. Timothy and the Smokers. Before, this, is, as we speak. This, is, this was before the uh, structure was built over those. Yep. Yeah. And that, so this is the, the, the fireside where folks will gather in the evenings uh, after the dinner magic. and kind of share. It's where the magic happens. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, magic some, happening. Some, some shots That's of magic good. happening. And shots. <laughs> magic <laughs> happening and shots happening. Shots of shot yeah. shots happening. Mm-hmm. And you can just, just see the like how much fun everybody's having. You know, it's like there's just a, like a lot of joy that's happening. But I think uh, that was these... Rachel Price behind Kristen there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's pretty telling that we all just kind of naturally fell silent when these pictures came. Out. Yeah. Like, yeah. You just, you go right back to that place. Yeah. That's a holy, holy moment in oh. my book. Face cake or what? What's that? <laughs> yes, that actually is face cake. <laughs> oh, oh no, no, that's the year before. That's no, it's uh, not space cake. That's Moon Moon. I think uh, it's the moon, yeah. Moon Rider. Moon Rider. The, a yeah. chef and the chef's helper Ray is also a brilliant musician. Traditionally, write at least one song. Yeah. yeah. And it's always the best song. Yeah, it's always the best song. It's <laughs> the best song. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh the gosh. banana song. I took that picture, and that's you guys playing the 
Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh man. Just it's kind of a recipe in well. some form. Warm bananas with chocolate chips, and you put it in the tin foil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember how it's a song. <laughs> this is where Dietrich has to go when he's been bad. Look at that. Mm. Like boat ride. Tersh is in there too. That's good to yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, Tersh for those Tersh with the green hat down in the lower left. He is my <laughs> Spring caretaker, so he's on the island, and he and I grew up going to the island together. So we've known each other for many years. But yeah, so he's always there. He's kind of yep. he's, he's kind of like he's he's part he's part of the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Back to that beautiful view from the from the dock. Oh. So this is yeah an, an evening shot facing south. Uh, to, um, and you can like you really just see how open the sky is, and it's just such a gorgeous place. So, all right, let's get into a little more conversation here. So, I, I'd like to go back to that first year. Oh, here's the loons. Excellent. Yeah, so, um, going back to that first year, and the folks that were there. What were the expectations when you went? Did you have a game plan, or was it just kind of a let's go and see what happens? Oh man, I wish I could go relive that first year. <laughs> like, what, was, what was the plan? I, we, I think we thought maybe we'll need some prompts or something. I think there was an effort made at having prompts, <laughs> but nobody picked up any prompts as far as I can remember. And um, and I just, it just was pretty organic. I mean, gosh. I I I, I will say that I in in my original concept of it. It could be songwriting or it could just be whatever people needed. You know, it's like if mm -hmm. we've been touring a lot. I think Amy was in that boat or she'd been touring. She, she, Amy Correa, she'd been working all the time. It's like, I was like, just do whatever. Go, go swim. Go hang out at your cabin. Just mm -hmm. decompress. Go, you know, we're all songwriters. And if, yeah the mood strikes us, we'll write songs. It's become a little more of a factory now, but um, <laughs> certainly in those early years, it, it was really just meant to, it was a retreat, just be whatever it's going to be. Now, now we, now we have standards to live up to and we have Zachariah Hickman. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it tends to bring, tends, tends to up the, up the bar, up the, up the uh, expectations of anything, but um, we have standards now. The structure bar, at least. <laughs> well, I and, and, it. yeah, Sorry. and it's probably Zach has probably written the most songs on the island, right? Oh, oh yeah, it's close. But Wait, Jossie, with Jossie, Jossie, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's got to be Jossie. Well, that's Jossie. that's oh, yeah. an interesting Hands thing down. too, because like I had a conversation with Jossie Adams um, from Arc Iris, and <laughs> she was talking about how in day-to-day -day life, she doesn't really get the chance to sit down and focus on writing and how it was after one of the Sub Rosa shows that we did at Passim where she talked about how this is her opportunity to write the next album, you know, like truly write the whole album. And, uh, you know, and I was just blown away by that idea that, like she, she could work like that, you know, that, that she was like, I'm going to go here, I'm going to write an album and, and then, you know, and then go on, and, you know, but, but also be, knowing how much collaboration happens at these retreats. When I think of a writer like Jossie, you know, it's, it's like, are you, are, is it always that people are writing together or do sometimes people just go to their cabin and write and then present? Mm. It's probably more that second thing, but then over the years that I've been there, which is over, which is maybe I don't know five or six years, I can't remember. It seems like every year there's more collaboration, more. Co I mean, I know for myself there is, but it seemed like in general uh, there was just like every year more and more collaboration. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I think everyone, for most a... people still take some time and just uh, hole up and work yeah. on their own thing. I think for a, a bunch of us, <clears throat> it's been the thing that actually opened us up to collaboration 
Like I, I, yeah, I know it's definitely true for me. I know I've talked to a, a few others. One or two of, might be in this room. Yeah. Who felt like co-writing songs was kind of an uncomfortable space until this thing. Yeah, I'm definitely one of those people. Yeah. Well, we're pretty comfortable with each other at this point. <laughs> Plus, if you have a song, I know for myself, I, I talk about this a lot at shows, but I don't write that much by myself. But it's like, well, this song really needs something of this touch and it's like oh well Dave Godowski's good at that or Chris is great at that or whatever you know and you've got those people right there to just mm -hmm. and then sometimes it's just fun to just see what you'll come up with you know but that's that's the, a really interesting thing about this too because where so many of you have been going year after year you know you each occupy your own space in the realm of songwriting you all have very distinct voices within that and so when you come together and and you know create an opportunity for something to happen you know it's not always going to happen you know you're going to have your your moments of creativity and other times you're just like no i just got to sit here and well, i know there was one year where laura cortese talked about how she didn't write a song at all and she wrote a science fiction story instead <laughs> you know and yeah. and she did. yeah you know but, but that's that's a creative endeavor yeah. you know like someone could be sitting there and painting i guess you know it, it's just sort of a a creativity i mean it is a the mm -hmm. sub a songwriting retreat but also other forms of art can fuel each other, yeah. you know, and can spark other things. Now, how many of you have been going, have gone every year by show of hands? <laughs> yeah. All right. So now for. And Rose, she didn't raise her hand. Yep. <laughs> I, I missed a year because I had a baby like oh, right, right. right at the time of the retreat. Right. Yeah. Right. And so Z Zach, when did you come in? Poor planning. Uh, my first year was the second year. Okay. And then um, I've been at every one since with the kind of asterisks of the time that I was out with Ray LaMontagne. Right. And I rented a came car in for a day. day off. I drove for nine hours. I was there for one <laughs> night and I got up at seven in the morning and drove back to the next gig. <laughs> oh that God. totally counts. I <laughs> that. Plus, I think you wrote five songs or something. <laughs> On that day. I yeah. wrote two songs that night. <laughs> And then, and then, Mark. Mark, when did you come on in to this? Like, uh, well, it was one year after I had uh, been invited for the first time because I remembered I was so excited to get invited, and then we had like a some kind of uh, medical emergency uh, in my family, and I had to stay home, mm. and I was just crushed. Mm. And I thought, like, okay, I'm. This that might have been my one chance to go, you know. Right. And and then I ended up going the next year, and after that, it was it's become the sole organizing principle of my life <laughs> to figure out how I get back on that island every year. And how about you, Chris? Um, boy, I was trying to get there for years, and I don't. Do you remember? It didn't like how did I come on the sixth one or something somewhere around there? I don't know. I just remember there were certain people you. And Annie Lynch, Neil Cleary, who I just were, you qualified. And it was just like, you have to come. You have right. to be here. One I of know. these years. I would pester you every year and then find, and you you had things and you had a kid, blah, blah, blah. It's just yeah. hard. And then finally you came. It's like, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> once I actually made, and then there were a couple of years. First, I was like, yeah, there's no way I can even do it. And then there were a couple of years when I was gonna, and then a tour would come up or something. And then the year that I finally did make it, then from then on, I was like, I like I had to arrange happens. around this. Yeah, yeah. like yeah, well, that's, like Mark was saying. That well, that, and that, and that's what I've you know heard from so many people where it's like once you do it, then it's like well, I, I know I need to rearrange my life around this <laughs> yeah. because this is a priority. But now, so for the folks that weren't there in the in the early years, granted, you know, you all know each other, you're all friends. Did you come into it with any sort of sense of like you were the new kid and and like like you didn't quite know how to fit into what this thing is yeah i mm. think i mean i was nervous a little bit the first time because um 
because I wasn't and I'm still mostly not a collaborative writer and I'm usually a very solitary writer and I also had a little kid so I was like desperate for the solitude writing time <laughs> and I was so I was worried even though like it's all people that I love and I wanted to hang I was worried I was just like so focused on whether or not I was going to actually be able to work there oh. and then and I like brought I still do this but now I hang out with people but the first couple of years I like brought my help brought a stove <laughs> and I like didn't come to the lodge ever, ever, ever until dinner every single night. And I was like, just a true hermit. And then, um, and then I relaxed after a while. But I think the first couple of days, it's so established. It's like a new school or a new like camp or anything. It's just like everyone's got all their little rituals and you don't really know what the hell's happening, but that doesn't take very long. <laughs> I should maybe explain Sorry. a little bit, the, just the logistics is that we just put a bunch of food in, kit, in the kitchen and for breakfast and lunch, People just kind of come whenever they feel like it and make some food. More often than not, Dave is there drinking coffee and ready to chat with whoever. And <laughs> so it'd be like, hey, I'm going to make some eggs. You want some eggs? Or, but there's, it's really dinner and then the music after that is the sole sort of organizing thing of the days. Now, when when you all get to the island, is it pretty open where, you, you know, like, you you just go find a cabin just find a cabin and 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 that's your that's where you're gonna live for the week or is that organized ahead of time and, well. <laughs> right, anyway, and how much does it change over the course of the week you know depends who you know <laughs> <laughs> well you know so do people spread out pretty far you know oh, thinking yeah. of of yeah. so the capacity of the, of mm -hmm. the island at its maximum is 125, is that correct? Something like that. Something like that. And for this retreat, there's 20, you know, up to 25, including staff or crew Maybe. and stuff like that. But, you know, the ability to mm -hmm. exist in that space and not see anyone all day, it's there. You, you know, you, you could oh, yeah. you could not encounter another mm -hmm. person all day long. And, you know, I've, I've been there when the island is full and I've been there... Uh, in somewhat reduced, you know, about half capacity. And, you know, even during Miles of Music Camp, which is generally at capacity, I could walk up up the ridge path up towards North Point during the afternoon and not see anybody for 20 minutes, you know, even when the island's full. And and so who, like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, there's the East Coast folks and the West Coast folks on the island because the East Coast is the sunrise. And I've I've stayed on the East Coast before. <laughs> I'm not an early riser. And, uh, you know, like you start to get sun at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And it can be a lot, you know, if, 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 especially if you're the person that's closing things down at the end of the night. And so I am definitely a West Coast person. Gorgeous sunsets. It's, uh, you, you know, and, and now, so who's an East Coast person in this group? It's just the, the, well, I the am, ones with kids, right? Those are, no, know. but I'm no, not a morning person, and I, the, the sun is a problem for me. But the these sun, days... That's a quote for Chris. The sun is a problem for me. <laughs> but these days, a few years ago, I moved uptown, uh, which, and I have never looked back. So now I'm kind of on the northeast or i say a shoveling ledge usually so it's oh like yeah the, way up there sort of getting north enough that yep. it doesn't go gotcha. like a laser into my eyes first thing and gotcha. then gotcha. Gotcha. very and, happy there and i mean like like dinty imagine you're always down the crew cabins which are down the, like the southern I'm, I'm i tend to be down that way just because i feel like i need to be reachable and sort of on call and responsible <laughs> yeah i mean so year to year do people find themselves going to the same cabin Oh, yeah. Yeah. We sort of settled into a routine. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about it, speaking to kind of something you said earlier, is that nobody's ever really talked about this. We've never sort of laid out any rules, but everybody generally understands that this is a, a creative retreat. And in order to make that happen, generally, you need to have some sense of ice feeling like you're isolated. Like it's, it's just, it's a little yeah. harder to work if you can hear somebody else singing or you can hear them playing guitar or fiddle. So everybody sort of naturally and respectfully chooses their cabins based on cabins that they like and the part of the island they want to be on. But they also are very aware of 
where the other people are and they want to give everybody the space to kind of do the work that they want to do. Well, and especially like, you know, given that, you know, some people are, don't have portable instruments, you know, piano players, there, there is a piano at fireside as well as a pump organ. And usually the Wurlitzer's up there, but then there's a couple of keyboards down at the, um, at the rec hall, you know, that I, that I, you know, so you can, you can spread out like that, but yeah, something like, it's not like a fiddle, where you can walk around anywhere and go do that. It does become a bit of a problem on in some really cold, damp weather, of which we well, have really had some. Like, I remember Chris, like, just being wrapped in sleeping bags and sitting on her, you know, it's, or, or you're, you're in your cabin with all the shutters down, everything closed up, just to try and maintain <laughs> someone. There are only so many heated spaces on the island. Right, and right. Two of those have pianos, and if Jossie and Rose Cousins want to be playing piano, <laughs> it's pretty hard to be anywhere near those spaces, you know. So, right. or well, so, so that's that was actually like I wanted to lead into that question of how does nature itself become part mm -hmm. of this process? Given that you know there are some years where. At nighttime, I bet it's dipped down even into the high 30s when you've been up there. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, you might have another year where you'll get the first 90 degree days of the season, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and knowing how cold that lake can be, uh, you know, at, at the beginning of June, how does that, you know, what does a cold, rainy week mean for you all? Um, creatively versus, you know, a, a day where it's nice and sunny and dry and, and you're able to go swimming and not, and not, you know, cry when you do it. You know, I, I, there, the, the number, cause I'm usually there for the week after for miles and music camp. And, you know, the, you, you've got to just commit to it and run off the dock and jump into the water. There is no wading into the water, uh, in Lake Winnipesaukee in early June. You, you just have to commit yourself to it and then know that you're going to have a panicked moment when all the air has left your body when you get into that water and and just think to yourself, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'm going to survive this. And, you know, but, but does that does that make a difference to you in your process for the week? Like how you're interacting with not just each other, but with nature itself? Um, I can say that w a pretty integral part of my process, especially when I'm writing by myself, is I love to make a fire. And so the years that it's wet and rainy, I can't do that. And I'm kind of annoyed at Mother Nature for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it also is kind of great when it's crappy because it really forces you to kind of buckle down and stay in front of the notebook when it's nice. I mean, not that the other activities don't have their their value. You know, you can work out a lot of stuff walking around or canoeing around or going out for a swim. But it does have the effect of focusing you on on the, the notebook when it's pretty crappy out there. But yeah. there's like a perfect there's like an inflection point beyond which it's just kind of miserable. I've told this story before, but I, I distinctly remember a year where it was mostly cold and mostly like really cold and really rainy. And as a result, people tended to um, congregate around the wood stoves and around wherever the, the indoor fireplaces were as opposed to the fire pits. And I remember that year, I remember it being really special because I seem to remember that we had more co-writes mm -hmm. that year than any other year, only because people would find themselves around a wood stove because they were just trying to be warm and somebody would throw out a, a song idea and then you were off to the races. Yeah. So I, I do think that my experience is, is that when the weather is, um, it's not great weather for being out in a canoe or being out on the dock. I think people do tend to, there's not a lot of other things going on. So you do tend to focus on the writing a little bit more. Um, and, and there, there is maybe more collaboration that happens because people do tend to congregate in the warm areas. Mm -hmm. but, that, but I've also got amazing memories of, you know, just this past year, me and Dave and Dietrich just ended up meeting up on the dock and 
just because we all happened to end up in, and it was because we were on the dock because it was beautiful on the dock and we ended up writing a song together. So, so you're just taking those moments, like, like truly being in the moment and, and finding whatever comes along like that. That's, and and now I, I know that it's not all just people in their cabins working all day and, and then coming together at night and showing what, what work you've done. I know there is a lot of mischief that happens on the island. There are a lot of, there's a lot of tomfoolery and, and trickery that's happening. Um, Zach. What, yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to put this to Zach. You know, what, what, what are some of those memorable moments outside of writing songs? Oh yeah. Um, I have, I have a number that's, that stand out. <laughs> me, but, uh, <laughs> But I think clearly the most heartwarming one was um, was Secret Marching Band. Yeah, <laughs> where um, Rose Rose Cousins had just put out her. Um, um, we made a Spark record, and I think she was feeling a little down at the time. And um, I I kind of pre organized um, a little bit of a of a of a mischief plan, and and. Aureli smuggled his kid's uh, bass drum from his drum set, Owen's drum set, onto the island. There's the drum head right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and and Charlie had his trombone and Dietrich had trumpet and um, a bunch of us were playing accordions and I had my Sousa, or not, I had one of my tubas. And so we had to, we, I wrote a little chart out and then we arranged it um in secret on my side of the island with I'm a, I'm a West coaster. And when Rose was occupied on the East side, so she wouldn't hear us. And we had a little rehearsal. And then <laughs> after dinner, we organized a sound off and a, and a, and a full on like parade down the, down the um, uh, path to the dock. And, you know, we're not, we weren't excellent. It took, um, <laughs> it took Rose a good 15 seconds to figure out what the hell was happening. And then you can hear on the recording, she just starts bawling. You know, it, it, it was really sweet. That was a that was a good piece of mischief. Yeah. <laughs> Secret marching band, love it. That's awesome. Yeah, that was a good one. Well, so something that that started happening not long after the first Sub Rosa songwriting retreat was. Kristen and Laura Cortese, who was at that first one as well, and Dinty, you know, started to talk about like, you know, Laura and Kristen had this idea of wanting to start a music camp and didn't really know where that was going to happen. And then you came to this place and a little spark went off and you started something else. Kristen, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, first, can I just say like that, that, that the entire experience was the most undersold thing on Dinty's part, like from, <laughs> you know, like it, that was my experience. So Dinty came, was like, well, I have the keys to this Island. It's a little cold up there, you know? And, and uh, I, so I drove up, you know, thinking, okay, here's this songwriting retreat. I don't know what we'll do here. And, and I, uh, literally as soon as I, Oh, you know what? I got there late. It was dark. And, and, you guys came over to pick me up on the boat and da- the, the pump organ was on the boat. <laughs> Remember you loaded the pump organ onto the boat. And so like Dave and Dinty or somebody was playing the pump organ, like as you came to pick me up on this dark lake, like this boat, and it was just magical. And so um, I got ferried across the water. You can only get to this Island by the boat. And as soon as I stepped onto the dock, I sort of looked around and I just had this thought, which I think I might've verbalized that this place is perfect. And the next <laughs> day I saw Laura had gotten there a little earlier. So when, when we saw each other the next day, we were like, this place is perfect. And so we had this sort of secret plan already brewing and Laura, who's a great fiddler, who probably most people in the Pessim community know her, Laura Cortese. And we were roommates at the time also in Watertown. Um, we are both lucky because we had fiddle camps as part of our kind of growing up. I mean, she was literally a kid when she started going to fiddle camps in California. And um, I was more like in my 20s when I, as a clogger, was hired to teach at some camps. Camps for adults are like a part of the, um, just a part of the fabric of the traditional music scene in the like old time Irish music, um, bluegrass music, Scottish music communities, um, which we were a part of. And so sort of natural, the idea of just convening in a place where, you know, regardless of whether you're an amateur or a professional. Um, 
to learn music and get better at it and have a community. And so we had been wanting to start something like that, but our vision was to do something like that that combined traditional music and songwriting. Um, you know, there were also songwriting. We had sort of turned from being traditional musicians to songwriters at some point. That was like a thing that happened in our careers. And uh, and we, we'd been, we'd also taught at songwriting camp. So it seemed like there were these two separate worlds, you know, that didn't, didn't necessarily mix. And so we wanted to have an event that that sort of combined that rhythm, the rhythm and the history of traditional music and um, the creativity of writing songs. And the space, the island is just perfect because it's got this, you know, big main rec hall down by the dock. We're like, that's the dance hall. And, you know, people, it was just sort of obvious to us how, how it could work. And so um, it was just right after the first Sub Rosa retreat that we wrote a proposal with Dinty's help and went to the, the, the committee that is in charge of the island sort of asked if we could rent it the next year. And um, so Miles, of, that's what started Miles of Music Camp. And we also were grateful to get a, a grant from the Iguana Fund that really helped. And um, so one of the different, so Miles of Music has been happening for, for, you know, I guess one year less than Sub Rosa now. It happens mm -hmm. the week following. And a big difference between that week and the Sub Rosa week is that anybody can come, anybody can apply to come to Miles of Music. The island is limited capacity. So these days it's a lottery. It sells out really quickly. Um, but it, our focus is on and has has always been on sort of increasing accessibility um, and, you know, inviting people of all ages, all abilities. Um, Increasingly, we're working on making the space more welcome, um, racially diverse and um, it's diverse in a bunch of different ways, stylistically. Mm -hmm. And so it's like it's sort of it's a it's a cool it's a cool experience. If there's somebody who's watching this podcast, it's like, I would like to go to that island. I'd like to be a part of that. There, this is, <laughs> that's a way you can look into that. And um, it it's this community I value so much. It's like my family, you know, and we, I feel, you know, we're sort of, we're lucky that we get to be invited to go to this thing year after year. And that has its beauty. And then miles of music is sort of this more open. Um, it's just a different experience, but it's also a beautiful way to experience the Island and, and, and make music. Yeah. So given that many of you that are here have also taught at miles of music camp. Uh, so you're there on the Island for two weeks, that first week, being this very small group of people focused on writing, you, you know, j just writing does, what is that transition like for any of you? Uh, just jump on in, you know, to go from that week of kind of self, you, you know, where, where you are going into yourself and writing to then going to this camp where you're kind of more looking outward to the people that are there, you know, what is, what is that transition like for you? You know, it's, it's sort of like being, you know, it, it, you know, is it like, you know, being in the woods for, for a week and then all of a sudden you're in the city because there's so many people around you and how does that, I mean, especially for you, Kristen, having the camp looming, mm for the next week does does that change your headspace for the retreat oh yeah the first couple of years it was really rough i probably should have gotten kicked out of this thing <laughs> <laughs> it was really rough it was a lot it was ambitious it was a lot um we've kind of figured out what we're doing now and you know somehow like somehow i've managed to keep writing these songs like i was thinking during while everybody was talking here i was thinking about all the songs that i've written at this retreat and like I even feel like my last solo record um, was called Gondolier and the cover is like an image of um, a head floating in the water, sort of like head turning away dreaming that a friend of mine who's an artist did just by listening to the songs. I hadn't told him the story of the songs at all. And he had just gotten this image of, of me being like an island floating in the water. So I think like this, the island turns up in the songs and I managed to keep writing eventually, you know, but it, it was it was a lot logistically at first. Because I mean, nobody's even described how the food comes to the island. like. <laughs> like, organizing a camp there for actually 120 people you know partly involves figuring out like how you're going to get food for 120 people this for a week to this island and then it, it all gets delivered on a boat um the boat has to go over to a certain dock you put all this food for the whole week on the boat you bring it to the dock and then it has to get taken in wheelbarrows 
from the dock, up like how many guards it yeah. up a hill to the kitchen? Um, it's like hours just to load the food in. So, but yeah, so, I, I mean, like, yeah, that, I mean, like, that's part of that transition where you're in yeah. such a small group with each other, and then everybody else coming in, and there becomes like a new organizational mind. And Zach, you must experience that because you're you, you, you're in charge of many things when you're on the island. Yeah, um, it. I think the the first year. I was a, I had to like sort of talk to myself a little bit about like don't feel territorial like <laughs> like you don't own this any more than anybody else does even though you feel like you do you know Deepwater Cove is not your personal cabin although, <laughs> when all the invaders come in it's, it's bound to feel like that but because it's a music camp and I think that really smooths the transition over a little bit you know if it was I don't know if it was Basketball camp would be a terrible. <laughs> Dindy, I've, Dindy, I've got an idea for next year. Yeah, I don't know. Especially since I've seen you play basketball. So. <laughs> I completely agreed not to talk about that on the podcast. <laughs> the ugliest game of one-on-one -on -one ever. Ever. <laughs> History of basketball is the worst that's ever happened. Um, I'm always kind of um, jealous of the people who – stick around it's, it's interesting because i get to see the transition i usually get there to the island before anyone gets there four miles of music but while a lot of you are still there for the retreat and so i get to like cross over with folks as you know before they come in and uh it, you know it's th there it is special at the camp to get to experience performances the first performances of many of those songs that were just mm -hmm. freshly you know they were hot out of the oven you know and, and you get to get to experience that um firsthand now are there when you when you folks go to start to write do, do you over the years now have you learned like I really work well with this person. I want to go write a song with that person, go into it like that. Or is it still, or is there still a lot of the, just letting it happen? Well, <laughs> Mark and I, I think we <laughs> no, would, no, it's a challenge, a yearly challenge. I, I think, I think we would both feel amiss if we didn't write at least one song together at each of these retreats, you know, after yeah. that, uh, we, we wrote look up our first year that we tried co-writing and then it was like okay we should try this again so mm -hmm. it's been a it's been a big big part of things for me for sure Dinty and mark i'll tell you it actually showed up on a miles of music um like a you know a questionnaire of like what do the campers want and it was requested that we have an online uh co-writing workshop from dinty child and mark Arelli. <laughs> Oh man! Based on your songs coming out of the retreat that wow. you're like, wow, the writers. That's wild. Mm -hmm. Proud of them. So, the, I, um, D Dave shared with us a Spotify playlist of songs that were written. <clears throat> Alan, Abby will drop that into the chat. We drop that into the chat. Did you already? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Look at there. It's right there. Um, so folks can listen to songs that have been written so many of the songs from the island have been recorded uh you know and and become many of the favorite song your favorite songs from that artist now given the volume of songs that happen on the island are there songs that just get left there and never never revisited again <laughs> many many <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there's like a like a, a, a song compost bin on the island. But they somewhere. get revisited. They oh, get yeah. revisited at least once a year on the island. I'm I'm <laughs> laughing mostly. I'm thinking mostly probably of Dave Gadowski's songs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we do tend to request Dave's songs every year. <laughs> like, there's some good compost. compost <laughs> yeah. like, can be it's useful. The song clivus, you know, sort of a. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I'm call him Clivus. That's great. <laughs> Clivus Kodowski. Uh, for sure. <laughs> but and, and all right, little little bit of just like numbers here. How many how many songwriters have gone to the island for this retreat over over the course of the ten plus years now? Hmm. 
I would guess 40. You think that right? I think oh, wow. between 30 and 40 have like set foot on the island. Because there's, there's probably been a lot that we're only just able to make it that one time and, and mm -hmm. haven't since then. And yeah. I don't know. I, I think I it's think even lower than 30. I think it's lower? I think it's lower than 30. I was going to guess no. 25. There's about 20 of us in like current rotation. And then I can only think of about six others. So I think it's less than 30 myself. Do, do you have any sense of how many songs have been written? May I field this question? Yes, yeah. please. Zach. You know exactly, don't you? Coming in hot with stats. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're asking, I have a chart numbers. Here. <laughs> numbers. Um, after my after the first year I was there, um, I was really interested in revisiting some of the recordings, and it was all a little haphazard for my tastes. Um, <laughs> um, so I um, I appointed myself the uh, sort of librarian and secretary of the archivist. Um, the archivist of recording every performance of every person's song for every year since. Um, I I missed a couple here and there, and there were a couple that were sort of ruined by like the wrong mic setting or the fan being too loud. But um, Rose Cousins traditionally has written down her whatever her impression of what the title of the song should be. <laughs> um, Last year, uh, Sean took that role over gracefully and excellently uh, with equally inferior penmanship. <laughs> and then um, I, I, um, I label and sort through and upload all the files. And I have, I have every original first take recording in the last 10 years on my Ooh. computer. Um, and my educated guess, including a, like an estimate for the first year, going to be 630 songs amazing <laughs> so that's, i mean so that average you know you're talking more than 50 songs a year oh yeah oh definitely oh, easily yeah, now. that's outstanding how long would it even take to listen to them all <laughs> I, I bet so, i mean some of them are dave's songs so they're really short they're really <laughs> short <laughs> i'm pretty short <laughs> It's a little known fact about songwriting. It's all, it it song correlates thing. with your height. height. Yeah. There's some equation. You can Google Maybe it. The songs are really long. And how yeah. wide you are is like how many times you change key. In a song. <laughs> oh my goodness. It changes Maybe. as we get older. <laughs> All right, so you know we, we've been at this for about an hour now. I, mm. I want to I want to do a last quick round here of from each of you individually, like. One quick, like, real standout memory <clears throat> of your time at the retreat. Mark, I'm going to start with you. Oh, got to think fast. <laughs> uh, I got to go with when Dinty and I wrote Look Up. That was yeah. a, a life-changing moment for me. Yeah. Very cool. Very and cool. and completely, a complete surprise. Yeah. Both, so. I wanted to write Beer Town Volume 2. Right. <laughs> Boy, did you fail. We, <laughs> we missed the mark on that wow, one. Wow, wow. All right, Sean Staples, how about you? Uh, I mentioned this earlier backstage, but um, the first time that Dinty and Rose Cousins played Down to You, yeah. I remember sitting across from them, and they just announced it like, this is something we kind of were working on today, and they were the first time they'd ever played it, so they were sort of tentative, and they played it, and it was jaw-droppingly beautiful. And I distinctly remember feeling, man, something special is going on here. Like there's, we're, we're doing some good work here. And I, I will, I'll never forget that moment. That's cool. That's cool. Chris Delmhorst. Oh, sh I thought I had those ladies first. Um, <laughs> You're like looking at it going like, what order is he going in? <laughs> I was, I had it. I don't even strong. know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, there's so many. I guess what, the first thing that really came to my mind was um, you get couple, one. You don't get you don't get a bunch. I you know. No, I'm only doing one. <laughs> it was a couple of years ago, and um, we had a little sort of um, convention in the boathouse with Rose and Rose and Annie, and um, it was the kind. I think maybe I wasn't there at first. You guys were writing um, "Love Comes Back." And then I sort of drifted over because I was doing something else, but I could tell something was going on in there. And then we all ended up just sitting on the floor uh, 
in a circle in that boathouse, and we worked on that. And ma- I think that same time we were working on my um, skyscraper song, and um, it was just like, just uh, an Im- one of the most amazing moments of collaboration uh, safety that I've ever had. It was really amazing. That's really nice. Dave Kadowski. It's probably uh, writing with Mark. Hmm. <laughs> Just in general, I mean, is there? That's not a moment. That's that's a yeah. it's very oh, vague. Boo. Every moment in time is actually <laughs> happening at the same time. Another limit, little known fact. So. Wrong. Zachariah Hickman. Um. <laughs> what, oh, yeah. Dave, what songs have you written with Mark? Let's For go example. with Lost in Translation. Mm. Oh, that song is so good. Man. So good. Um, it's a great song. That was I just didn't. I didn't really. I didn't know I could do collaborative songwriting really before. So it's kind of a cool mm. revelation. Yeah, it becomes a new a new tool in the toolkit. That's really great. Which is crazy because Dave is so good at it. So yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Zachariah. Um, okay. Uh, I spent four days like long gaming an epic prank on everyone that involved like moving a ladder a few feet every day so that it was normalized. <laughs> and then I hid Dietrich Strauss in a secret <laughs> hole inside the wall 12 feet above. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't even know it was there. The Jinsey didn't even know it was there. And I, I made him a bed with whiskey and some pillows and a light, and we hid him in there for hours. A bottle of whiskey. And then a bed of a whiskey, song, yeah. I wrote a song called Hiding. Why are you hiding? And and people are like, oh, it's one of his ex cute songs. And then suddenly this trumpet solo comes out of nowhere. And yeah, everyone's like, wall. what is happening? And then, boom, drunk Dietrich kicks the door open, <laughs> starts wailing on the trumpet. And the audio recording of the surprise in people's, uh, <laughs> the surprise was so hilarious. Yeah. Very funny. That was a try up, Zach. It really was. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right, Kristen. <laughs> Oh my God. I think I, it is hard to pick, but I think for me, the magic moments are always at night. Um, listening to the people who have the skill to just like write a song and then like deliver it that exact day perfectly, which I think <laughs> I'm especially amazed by because I am just like not that kind of songwriter. I think I'm like probably. Like even like Charlie Rose even was making making fun of me and I didn't even recognize it. For, but like when I write a song on the island, the, when I perform it that night, it's still very much a draft. Like so much I can rarely even get through my own songs the day that I write them. It takes like I have to marinate on them for a long time and they come out the other end somewhere down the line. Nobody hears it. But um, I'm thinking of this one moment that Caitlin and Caitlin Canty and Annie Lynch had gotten together in the boathouse earlier that day and wrote this song together. And they just started singing it like at the beginning of our song share. It's like one of the first songs and they were singing in unison and their voices were like indistinguishable from each other. And something, it was a song called wild heart that I actually Caitlin's going to put on this new record that's coming out. If any of you are fans of hers and it's finally actually, it's going to come out. Um, <laughs> But, the, but I swear to God, the first time they ever sang it on the island could have been the record like five years ago. Wow. It was just perfect. And I, my jaw just dropped. I was like, how, you know, how do you not only write the song, but you can sing it and deliver it like as though it's always existed. Mm. And I feel like that happens again and again every night for everyone other than me. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the, <laughs> that's one of the moments that sticks out for me. For, for Caitlin, it was probably, she was like, well, a, a moose visited me in the morning and gave yeah. me this song. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Literally, yeah. there was a moose on the island one year. On her porch. Yeah, totally. on her porch. Rose Polanzani. Um, I have to think about, like, it was one, it would, might have been the first year. I remember, this just, like, encapsulates for me, like, how the island can work. And, and it's, um, it's sort of my memory, but it's Kristen had like recorded a bird call on her phone 
And then she was like walking around the island trying to transcribe the bird call into a melody that she could actually use. And then Dave used it. And then we're like, can you put it in a song? And then we were all like creating some kind of, we created That was the glitter. Magical. The song I was talking about. That, it. that recording from that first night is magic. It's magic. And it, it and it just informed so much of like the kind of arrangements I would try to write in the years after it, like just trying to to get at what what other people are doing and like hearing. I I, I actually gave Kristen so much trouble about her Mazda music stuff because I was like, I need more of that that you did last year and that stuff. I was like, I need to hear it. Like so and it's just I need to hear other people going at it like that because it's so inspiring for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was amazing. That and whole it, to me yeah. that original recording goes on the greatest hits record. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. so cool. And it, because it was, I think that part of what was magical to like for people who haven't heard this is that like the the writing itself was informed by like the 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 people and the parts that were possible in the room. You yeah. know, like there was a lot of sort of backup vocals that people could do and fiddle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fiddles. And it was just like it was created around the the bodies that were there and the skills that were there, kind of the voices. Yeah. yeah which is yeah. yeah. Amazing. How about you, Dinty? Oh my God. It's uh, too, too many. Too many. <laughs> too many. I, I'm I'm gonna break your rule, Matt. I'm gonna mention three things. So the first <laughs> Dinty, you, you could be on the island right now, as far as we can tell. You're just a floating head in a sea of blackness behind you. <laughs> the first one is, is the way, basically ties into these other things, where the way, when we get together at night and after dinner and play each other the songs and stuff, and the way, and Dave mentioned this before we got on air, um, that we're kind of a band now. And when you have... Chris Domhorst and Rose and Rose Cousins and Annie. I mean, you have all these amazing singers sitting next to each other and just coming up with these parts and hearing all of that just happen in real time is just insane. Mm-hmm. Um, and then person like a personal, so that's like my general moment. The personal moment was the year that we were going to get rid of an old piano and it was out on the dock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's out in the open air like right on those pictures, like right behind, like right in front of Zach. Zach could be sitting at the end. And um, I was trying to write a song and I usually often co-write, but I was like, I found um, the words to the song Tired Blue Shirt in my, or I just found these words in my notebook. And I sat at that piano outside. I think I might've even been in the dark at some point or something and, and, came up with the chords of Tired Blue Shirt, just sitting there like at a piano in the middle of wow. space. Mm-hmm. And that was cool. Incredible. And then um, in, the, in the prank world, um, <laughs> one of the early, there was an early year where I think Rose Cousins said, if a sandwich came out of the sky, I would eat it. And I, I, Descended from the ceiling. Was it, it descended from the ceiling or something. And so I... <laughs> I quietly went out of the room and went in the kitchen and made a sandwich and climbed up on the catwalk above her and, and like lowered a sandwich. Which no up. one knew existed. This was like an architectural yeah. feature of the room that I guarantee no one other than Dinty had ever noticed. This was yeah. okay to stand above where Rose was sitting. And I got in on a spring and like all of a sudden the sandwich descended from the ceiling right right into her lap. So good. <laughs> We have a good time. Oh, That's wow. absolutely, absolutely. Well, <laughs> uh, the shows are coming up on May 2nd and 3rd, uh, rescheduled mm-hmm. from this weekend. I'm hoping to get as many of the folks that, that went last year as possible to come to that show. Uh, one question that I keep getting so often whenever people come to the shows are like, will you ever as an entity make a record together. And I get like, there's some, I mean, there are probably a lot of records out there that most of you are on together in one way or another, but would you ever consider as a group making a record together? That's, the hardest that's, that's a hard no, that. I'm going to take <laughs> from that silence. And, uh, um, that's, that's very much something that we've been talking about and um, had, uh, had, had this 
had this shown up and canceled, I think we might have made a little bit of headway to see if that would be a possibility. But um, yeah. mm -hmm. I think collectively, we'd all, we would all agree that that would be an awful lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. but, but we don't want to bring, you don't want to like do it during our one week. Right. You know, we can't give that up. So we've got to mm -hmm. make the time outside of that. Um, different kind of brilliant. I think the silence is probably the fear of trying to choose which yeah. songs to record. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That would be <laughs> we did record as part of Rose's. When we did The Rabbit, we also recorded like some other songs at the same mm -hmm. time from the island. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where those, I don't know what happened with those, but. Yeah, because we had a huge band of a lot of us in the studio. Yeah. And I remember, and I think you might have had some iguana money or something, and we, yeah. we recorded some songs. That was a long time ago. And, you know, and, and, and what I was excited about this conversation about the island and about this retreat is because, you know, people... I get asked all the time. I'm sure you get asked all the time, you know, when, when we have the shows, and, you know, like people want to know, is this being documented? Is there going to be some sort of documentary about this process and everything like that? And, and what, what I would posit is probably no, because once you this is try to make right a document, exactly, you know, like, so it's be <laughs> because you can't do the thing and, and have, people around you documenting you doing the thing it, it stops you from being able to do the thing you know and anyone that has watched all seven and a half hours of get back right now you know mm. you, you see the intrusion mm. of the camera yeah. and how that makes you self-conscious about what you're actually doing as opposed to being able to do the thing that the camera wants to capture in the first mm -hmm. place yeah. You know, the best you can do is capture moments here and there around <clears throat> the bigger idea. But that's what I, I was really excited about, being able to sit and have a conversation with you all about what this process looks like. Mm -hmm. Because, I, I, you know, I, I'm sure you get asked all the time about, like, what is that week like? That week must be crazy. <laughs> and um, yes and no, probably a lot of the times, you know, like th there's some of it that's just a bunch of friends hanging out. And then you also all happen to write really amazing songs. Mm. And, and that's so, where a lot of it comes from. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, so, so we are all lucky that you are able to do this because we get to see the result of it. So thank you all. We are all lucky, Matt, that you guys support mm. us. And we're lucky that we're lucky that we have this beautiful island to go to <laughs> and we're lucky. We're the lucky ones, and <laughs> we are we're we're just, very, very lucky. Yeah. And the iguana fund has been a huge part of it too. You know, Absolutely. it's like I think I think at this point, without iguana funding, we'd still make it happen. But like Dinty said earlier, I mean, it was the iguana fund, and just that little infusion of money that was sort of the initial spark of like, hey, wait a second, I think we can do this. So yeah. we are incredibly indebted to. Passim and the Passim community for yeah. helping to get this thing started, you know, and keeping it going. Well, I mean, it would yeah, keeping it going, you know. I mean, I think we did it the first year, and then we applied again the year after, and then basically Passim came to us and said, "We love it. Th this is what we want this money to be spent on. We can't think of anything we'd rather this money to be spent on. So, let just you will keep funding it, and you guys keep going and, and writing the songs, and and we're so grateful for that." Well, and, and just the, the the volume, the sheer volume of incredible songs that have come out of this that, you know, like I said, have, have been, become people's favorites that come to the club for all of your shows. Uh, it's just, an, it's an amazing thing to know that there's this place where those songs live, or at least mm -hmm. were born. Yeah. So thank you to all of yeah. you for being here. Rose, Dinty, Zach, Kristen, Sean, Chris, Dave, and Mark. Um, so grateful to have you here. Thanks to Abby, who's been putting up the links and, and showing the pictures and, and all the things. And uh, oh. Margaret. <laughs> um, Hi, Margaret. Hey, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thanks to all of you. Thanks to everyone that's tuned in and watched. Remember, the shows are going to be on May 2nd and 3rd at Club Passim. And um, make sure you support Passim because uh, 
it is we're going to keep doing these shows and we're going to keep supporting this retreat yeah. and uh we're just so grateful to people for for gathering here when it's not safe enough to be in the club putting on this mm -hmm. show and not logistically possible yeah and we're yeah. gonna get back to doing it again. Yay! And I uh, can't can't wait to hear what this year brings. Yeah. yeah. See all you guys. You want to go hang out? <laughs> <laughs> I love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, bud. Bye, you guys. Bye, See you on the dock.